少，因灵寻，卡耶伊拉灵，阿萨卡哈拉灵，扎卡拉灵，少爱灵灵寻。Namaste. So, this is a second section of comments on the second chapter of Srimad Devi Bhagavatam on the specific topic, which I didn't want to touch in the previous comments because it's too big. We're going to devote this whole、uh, recording just to this topic: the man blunder. What is the man blunder? Well, I first came across the term on one of my Shakta Guru's websites. In fact, the site is called manblunder.com, and if you get a chance to visit it, it's a, a wealth of knowledge there about the Shakta religion. And it took me a while because he doesn't describe the meaning directly. But indirectly, he shows on his site in great detail how the typical cultural assumption or the cognitive bias that God is male is actually a tremendous blunder. What is a, a cognitive bias? What is the Cultural assumption. Well, we see it especially in the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But it's also prevalent in Hinduism that、uh, everybody thinks that God is male, to put it very simply. But let me read you this、uh, section. From Shrimad Devi Bhagavatam, from the second chapter, it is commonly thought that Brahma is the creator of this universe, and the knowers of the Vedas and Puranas say so. But they also say that Brahma is born of the navel lotus of Vishnu. Thus, it appears that Brahma cannot create independently. Again, Vishnu. From whose navel lotus Brahma is born, lies in Yoga Nidra on the bed of Ananta, the thousand-headed serpent, in the time of Pralaya. So, how can we call Bhagavan Vishnu, who rests on the thousand-headed serpent Ananta, as the creator of the universe? Again, the refuge of Ananta is the water of the ocean, a Karnava, a liquid. Cannot rest without a vessel. So I take refuge of the mother of all beings, who resides as the Shakti of all, and thus is the supporter of all. So this is the defeat of the man blunder. I mean, just consider the logic.、Huh? If we see that something is dependent on something else, then we can't say that it's independent. So we see that Brahma is dependent on Vishnu. Vishnu is dependent on Ananta Shesha. Ananta Shesha is dependent on the ocean, the Karnava, the causal ocean. And the ocean, being liquid. Requires some place to rest. This is the kunda or the kula. The life energy is called the kundalini. Kunda is the depression at the base of the spine, where the life energy rests. So the kunda or kula of the causal ocean is the mother. She is the prime cause of the creation. Everything else is secondary, derivative, and dependent 
on her energy. Uh, Shakti means force. Uh, may the force be with you. <laughs> but those people don't know what force really is. Force is Shakti. Shakti is the mother. Mother is the creatrix. The male was the creator, but the female is the creatrix. Now, she is also an extension or aspect of Shiva. In fact, she's called Shiva because she is the equivalent form in the female aspect of Shiva, the male supreme. But Shiva is completely unconditioned, transcendental, objectless, subjective awareness. He has no activities, not even consciousness, only awareness. That means there's no object. So without an object, there can't be desire, there can't be activity, there can't be form, name, or anything. But we just read a prayer on the Gayatri, the goddess Gayatri, and how she, as an aspect of Divine Mother, is the name and form from which consciousness is derived. When we studied the Buddha's teaching, Paticca Samuppada, we uh, saw that consciousness is derived from name and form. Without name and form, you can't be conscious of something. And the prime example of this is that every night when we go to sleep, we enter into Brahman. But we don't notice it. Why? Because we don't have the adequate name and form to understand Brahman. Without that name and form in our ontology, in our background knowledge of what exists in the world and why things are the way they are, we don't notice what is happening to us every single night. We don't realize that we merge into Brahman and are recharged. And the next morning we get up and feel, oh, I had such a good rest. Huh? So the consciousness is there. We remember that we had a rest, but we don't remember anything about it because there's no objects. In Brahman, in Shushupta, deep sleep, there is no object to consciousness, only consciousness itself. And when consciousness takes itself as an object, that's the fourth, Turiya, the fourth state of consciousness. So when we realize Turiya, we also realize the goddess. This is the thing. They are one and the same. We read yesterday that her form, her nature, is Turiya Chaitanya. Turiya Chaitanya means the fourth state of consciousness. This is self-realization. Now, why don't we understand these things? Well, first of all, maya, or illusion, is the power that creates this world. Because really, there is no duality. Duality is only an appearance within the oneness of Brahman. So then, how does this whole world come into existence, and why do we perceive it the way we do. And why do we think that we are a separate individual when actually we're just part of Brahman? Well, this is called cognitive bias. And a specific form is called uh, confirmation bias. So each layer of Maya is a form of cognitive bias. It seems complete in itself. And it seems logical and self-consistent. But that's only because it rests on an assumption, an ignorant assumption that 
is unaware of the actual reality beneath it that supports it. Just like Brahma is supported by Vishnu, Vishnu is supported by Ananta and so on. We think the world is supported by the physical laws and so on like this. Now this is all Maya. <laughs> but as we peel away these layers, one by one, we come closer and closer to the reality. And when we realize the mother, the Turiya Chaitanya, that's self-realization. So cognitive bias or confirmation bias is the tendency to search for, interpret, favor, and recall information in such a way that affirms one's prior beliefs or hypotheses. It is a type of cognitive bias and a systematic error of inductive reasoning. People display this bias when they gather or remember information selectively or when they interpret it in a biased way. The effect is stronger for desired outcomes, for emotionally charged issues, and for deeply entrenched beliefs. People also tend to interpret ambiguous evidence as supporting their existing position. So it's very tricky to see through this cognitive bias, this confirmation bias, where we project our already existing deeply held beliefs on our perceptions and interpret them through that filter. But we've already been through this in Buddha's teaching extensively, so I'm not going to go into it further now. I just want to point out that spiritual truth cannot be realized by inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is called avaroha. Avaroha, I'm sorry, aroha. Aroha means ascending. So we, it's like we try to take some facts and then we try to generalize from those facts and state laws or principles and so on. We abstract. Huh? And this is called aroha, upward reasoning or inductive reasoning. And the thing about inductive reasoning, it's never certain. The example is the black swan. Well, I've seen so many white swans. So that means all swans are white. That's inductive reasoning. But then some explorers went to Siberia, I think it was, and they found some black swans. Oops, so much for that theory. <laughs> so that's the black swan. That's the, the uh, unprecedented, unprecedented, unanticipated, unpredictable event that blows up our theory every time. So actual truth is realized by deductive reasoning. Uh, avaroha panta. The descending path, beginning from scriptural revelation. But the thing is, if we test the conclusions of deductive reasoning, we find that they're borne out by experience. For example, if we chant these mantras that we've been teaching on this channel to um, please or worship the Divine Mother, they have tremendous effect, tremendous power, shakti. Uh -huh. And uh, I only know one viewer that actually took me up on the offer to become initiated into this mantra. And he and I write messages back and forth like, wow, this is great. <laughs> and it just keeps getting better. So this spiritual truth has to be received from someone who has realized it. That is guru. There's a prayer. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Anmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha That I was born into the darkness of ignorance. But my spiritual master opened my eyes, chakshur militam, with the torchlight of knowledge, jnananjana. Therefore, tasmai, therefore, Sri Gurve Namaha, 
I offer my respectful obeisances to him. Who else could do this? Who else can show us the actual truth? Only someone who, by the grace of their gurus and by the grace of the goddess, has been able to peel back these layers of the onion until they find the actual truth. So this is the first hammer blow in this Purana onto the man blunder. And you're gonna hear it again and again and again. Sutta Goswami just systematically demolishes the whole view, which is prevalent even among the Advaitins, huh? which is kind of ridiculous, but yeah, that only a man can give spiritual truth. Only a man can become self-realized and so on. Uh, it's just a ridiculous uh, cognitive bias, which this Purana will help us overcome so that we can reach authentic self-realization. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung.